What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Durr, and today I have another bonus episode with Dorge from Fire Knock, and we are also joined by Dave Murray from Vital Limits, and we are diving in today to talk about Dorge's Aero Concept. Now, that's not A-R-R-O-W, that is A-E-R-O, Aero Concept, and this is Dorge's take on kind of a an insert system. So, I'll let you guys listen to the podcast to learn more about what he's talking about there. But I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this. So please don't skip through it. Listen to the entire conversation with Dorge. He really, really wants to help us out as bow hunters and as archers to have a better experience through these products. So please take the time, listen to what Dorge and Dave have to say. While you're at it, please give me a written review on iTunes. It really helps me out reaching new people. So if you like what you're hearing, maybe there's someone else that you think is going to like to hear it, share it with them, leave me a review, and we will continue to bring you these gear episodes. So for now, let's get into today's episode. All right, everyone, we are back today with another episode with Dorge and Dave Murray, the archery experts. And if you haven't already, please go back and listen to last week's episode with these guys, because this week we're moving on and we have some really exciting stuff to talk about. I know Dorge is fired up this morning to talk about it. How are you guys doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad to see everybody after after the last episode. I really want to dive into one of the most exciting part of the Aeroshaft and uh, and also my development and research on what Aeroshaft actually does and does not. So I think this week is going to be really exciting because I really want to talk about something that we and um, want to explain what it does and what it really do for the new generation of archery. I mean, everything moving onward from 2016 that did make, make this so critical. I mean, um, the what, what I'm going to talk about is a thing called Aero Concept. Actually, the word phrase was invented by my very good friend, Dave Murray. He said, Dodge, that's, that's a concept. I said, yes, it is a concept. Let's call it Aero Concept. Well, well, let me give you the history of what this is about. In 2017, I, was, uh, I, I got introduced to a very good friend of mine called uh, Jim Kelly. He is the inventor of reverse draw crossbow, Scorpion. He, he's the owner of it. And uh, he was having a very hard time to get many arrow fly right with his. Then the crossbow that he have is, uh, at that time, it's called Audi uh, D165. It's the first 425 feet per second crossbow. At the same time, the only arrow, crossbow arrow that is available at the moment was a gold, was a gold tip laser, uh, laser tool. Okay. A gold tip laser tool is nothing more than a gold tip 22 series, which is a 300 spine arrow cut to 22 inch. Now you can imagine, you got a 300 ID with a 300 spine, 22 inch shooting at 425 feet per second. I mean, just like every single arrow, once in a while you got a good one. But the problem is that how do you get to many good ones that should reasonably accurate and have consistency, which is where his problem is. His problem at the time, he say, I got a uh, uh, laser tool, and out of 12, that's one of them is called a magic arrow, but out of the 11, they pretty much can't shoot. I say, well, the, the problem is that it's, uh, uh, it's not enough spine. The arrow is too weak. It goes on like noodles. And then at that moment, I figured that I would do something magical. Actually, not magical, but the logical is the word. <laughs> I go ahead and put a go tip 22 insert and insert an arrow OD that go tip make that is a 298 thousands on the OD. So I put a seven and a half inch in the front of it and glue it together. But the arrows all great good. That's the beginning of arrow concept. What, what actually happened is that the first arrow tube and the second arrow tube, because they are made of different modulation carb, when you flex it, they have different frequency. As you have different oscillation frequency, when you put them together, they will cancel each other, which is now resulting in a, in a much faster recovery arrow, but at the same time, a stronger spine arrow. Well, in theory, it works great, but in actuality, what I discover is uh, not a very good idea. <laughs> it's not a, not a very good idea the way I did it. It, was, it. it should good for a very short while, which began the whole development process because the arrow start 
after a while, the two carbon tubings are separate from each other. The arrow start cracking between the insert and the tubing, and not to mention the insert start falling out. Well, that lead to a lot of development, a lot of research, and find out that the problem with this whole process is that every glue in the market, when you try to do that, do not. Because we got from tubing to tubing, or called layer separation, because all the glue I use, like super glue gel, super glue, normal epoxy, and so on, all have one problem. As the arrow flexes, the glue actually crumbles. The decrystallization of the glue breaks. Well, then the two layer no longer maintain, and then from arrow to arrow, because the layer separation, the consistency of the arrow goes straight down. And at the same time, the insert between the carbon as the arrow flexes, so that creates a huge amount of disturbance between the carbon tube, inner carbon tube, and the insert, which caused the outer arrow, arrow tube to crack, in most cases break. Well, that leads to two discovery and invention and patterns. The first thing we recognize, the only way to keep the first tube not cracking, the inner tube not is that we need to put a shoulder on it. So the arrow tube had to go into aluminum insert that go into the arrow shaft. That take, which become the the, the the fifth US patent I granted on archery is about double shoulder. That actually take up that problem. Then really get deep into it is the problem with the glue. Actually, the entire arrow concept do not work until the glue works. We have to talk to Hank, uh, talk to uh, um, Hankos, which is part of uh, uh, Loctite. My Loctite part Hankos, and then research into what glue to use. We end up to find a glue that's really, really good. It did everything we wanted to. It's a two-part epoxy. It got a 36-hour cure time, but a cure time. But there was one critical factor: it does not harden. It bonds, but it doesn't harden. You have a two and a half to three C penetration. So now imagine this: we got this glue. We'll penetrate both into the carbon from two to three C, and it do not harden. The only downside is that twelve hundred dollars a gallon. Now, which explain why a lot of people say, you thought you got two tubes of 20 cc and you want 20 bucks for it. I say, yeah, how that up actually, I technically sell that at cost. <laughs> but that is where the magic is. The magic of arrow concept is actually in the glue. And um, Dave was one of the few guys who did it with me. And uh, I think he can chime in and tell you what this wonderful stuff can do. So what you're saying is with the glue, because it does a hard and it's going to act kind of like its own dampen um, between the tube, um, the inner tube and, and the shaft. But it still lets the arrow behave like an arrow. Actually, you did it did nearly 99% right. Is this actually what happened is that we prevented the, the physics, what called in, in construction, the physics called layer separation. That was one of the detrimental part of the previous generation in the process of developing arrow concept. But that glue really make all the difference in the world because see, without the glue, the dampening process will no longer be consistent, which means the arrow bending will no longer be consistent, which means the arrow is no consistent, it's no good. Right, right. So you, you, we want the arrow to still behave like the arrow, and that's what the glue allows, rather it locking everything up. Correct. Because see, uh, some people was thinking that this is all about an insert because some people even go so far to make a six, seven inch insert and put it inside the shaft. But, but that's a good point because I heard about people. Um, how do you mention that? Um, <laughs> why why can't we have like a just a big, long metal five inch insert? Well, because if you do that, that arrow end up with a five inch plus whatever broadhead length is, that whole thing become the fuel point length. Wait a minute, no, so no, what you're no. saying is, so what you're saying is if I have a 20 inch arrow, and I mm -hmm. put, let's just use five inches as an example of a metal insert. I have a 15 mm -hmm. inch. Arrow. Yes, you end up with 15 inch and six inch fuel point, which is also the same thing. I mean, this is another interesting point because I talked to a lot of guys with the, with the NFAA and also National Archery or uh, International Archery. Imagine you got a gold, you got a, uh, a basic uh, a target arrow. And then you got those break points. Remember the point, the point that's five inch, three inch long and mm. you break the points out to glue it. What's happening to the shaft? That section of the yeah, shaft. So what happens at a natural bending point in the shaft? Does it get moved backwards? Absolutely, it does. Because in, then, then, actually, imagine this. You've got a, let's go with a crossbow, which is a small number. We go with a 20-inch arrow, and then you've got a 5-inch insert in it. Your note is going to be 1 inch behind the 5. And a half, 7 inches. Whatever you add in front of it, you shall fuel point. Then the whole thing becomes your, your static of your fuel point. Now, if you remember when we talk about the, 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 the entire action of the arrow shaft when you first shoot it, you also got the node, 
Now imagine your node is all the way behind the insert. Mm. So when you shoot, that's where your arrow rests or your front of your uh, your crossbow should rest. Now mm. where is it? In that getting point on the ridiculous, the reason the node is so important because that is where the arrow flexes at zero. That means that is technically no flex on that. And that is where when you find your arrow, you build an arrow, you put a broad arrow, a few point on it, the first thing you do is find your but the no is no longer as important in arrow concept compared to others because the no is no longer one point, which in every single arrow does a node. The no is where the arrow flexes on the axis in the front part, which is where your arrow rest should be. But so just for so our viewers, like what a little bit. Okay. First of all, I want to show you how to find it. First of all, get yourself a block of hardwood. Okay. And then you hold the arrow on the knock loosely. Then you put a few point on it and you slightly tap the arrow on the front about three inches and you tap on that hardwood until you heard it hit a spot. That it doesn't mean bang, 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 it'll bounce on it. The reason when you hit that spot, it was dead because that is the S turning point of the arrow shaft wind. And that is the point where your arrow rest should be. Now think about it. If, if, your, if your note is found and your angle or your shaft is very, the softer your shaft is, the worst is for the parabolic action of the node. Here. Think about it. Assuming the, no, the the entire arrow next to node have, a, say, a 90 degree flex in it. The moment you're off the node, every single inch, every, every single, if you're off the node by one inch, based on the angle, you're off the center by 0 0.71 inch. So that is pure tangent. By, the con by using the concept system, that becomes beneficial because we actually broaden the node point. And yes, the word broaden is not used correctly. The one is that we lower the entire angle to the point that it is less significant for the node to be one point. Because you imagine if passing the node, we have 45 degrees on this side, on other on this side. The moment you pass that point, every single distance is geometrically increases. But then it's the moment when we lower the angle, or in the case arrow concept, we found out the angle was lowered by about close to 1,200%. Yes, you hear me right. So we're talking about 12 times. We're talking four to five degree compared to 45 degree. So at the moment when you move, the distance increases from, away from the node, your total oscillation difference from the center is minimized, which is not critical in vertical bow, but is extremely critical in crossbow. Because as you know, crossbow, that is no error rest in most cases. Now on the uh, concept system, um, that's in, in short, we put more energy behind the point because we got faster recovery from mm -hmm. launch. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about a little bit what happens in the beginning stages on how that's beneficial well, that we're not going crazy downrange? Well, actually, uh, the, from the from this high speed video uh, we have done. We say that we see that on a normal arrow, the arrow takes about 16 yard to 17 yard to recover on the 246 and 300. The moment we go to 204, is going to push around 18 to 20 yards. In the 166 class, it is more like uh, 22 to 23 yards. The moment we put an arrow concept system on it, because we do most of our tests on the 300, which is cross all side and 246, the amazing part is that we find out an arrow with full recovery in nine feet instead of three, three yards compared to 16 yards. Those are actual video that we found out, which means that on a pure print energy loss, we are talking a 600% reduction. If that don't make anybody sit up and take notice, I don't know what. But then now I know with Crossbow, when we did the high-speed video on that, the arrows were going into rotation within inches of leaving the bow. Um, which, you know, I've seen lots of other videos out there with like blazer veins or uh, uh, A that it's, you know, three to five feet. Correct. That, it that itself is, is the characteristics of vein. And, and without that reason, the arrow concept becomes so important because we are also the inventor of arrow vein, which I would, I, would, I would postpone the discussion of veins in the next episode. But I will just say that important. If on the case, that if you've got veins like air that can turn within two and a half inch of the launch compared to a blazer at five feet of the launch, or even in most cases, the first turn, like three feet out. Now, 
Imagine if the arrow in this process of recovery, what is the back of the arrow behaving? And what the, since if the arrow is flexing, not very tight elliptically or gyro elliptical process, as I call it, every single vein is now pointing at a different direction on drag, which is now is a total chaos, which will not detrimental to the entire correctness of the arrow flight. In other words, you say, imagine the initial before the arrow stop oscillating, that whole process is pretty much like the arrow behaving inside your barrel. Now imagine your barrel is not straight or the, the, the bullet is not rotating correctly in your barrel. The longer distance outside is no longer relevant or accurate. I think the best way to describe it is that the launch cycle of the entire is that from the moment you release the launch from the arrow to leave the air rest is same as the firing of a bullet. The moment the bullet leave from the firing shell to the barrel is the same as we an arrow launching from away from the air rest to the point that the arrow stop oscillating and going to a to gyro. And then from that point onwards is now the true arrow flight. Now the downside, which most people don't understand. Most people say, oh, I don't shoot past 25 yards. In most cases, all my kills are under 20 yards. Technically at that moment, you are like holding a gun with a barrel on top of the animal with no distance. Nothing matters. Whatever. Yes, absolutely. Unless you're really that bad, then I can't help you. But then you see that all the things that people are talking about is after the arrow went through the, the violent oxidation cycle and go into a tight elliptical gyro. Okay, let me, let me step back and let me explain what happened. An arrow will flex violently in the initial launch cycle. Then you'll go and go into a mediocre flex. And that's what's called the oxidative entry paradox or whatever people want to call it. The oxidation process is where error will eventually go to the point, you go to a very tight elliptical flex. Yes, arrow never stop flexing until you hit the target and stationary. So the arrows are always flex in flight. And that tiny flex is needed for the arrow to fly through. And the arrow concept is to control after you launch, first of all, you do two things. It control the magnitude of the arrow bending while inside the violent launch cycle. And it will significantly decrease the entire oxidation cycle in the process going to the tabulate. So we know that by you, now this is the basic calculation we come up with. Assuming you've got a 20 inch, air, a 22 inch arrow, by putting in a basic arrow concept tube in it, every inch you put in it is equivalent to about half to two thirds reduction of the arrow shaft. That means if you put a 10 inch shaft on a 30 inch arrow, the arrow will flex and with the spine behave like it was only 20 inch, plus or minus maybe 20, 30%. Depends on the outside OD, the spine of the shaft plus the spine of the inner tube. But that calculation, that means if you got say, 30 inch minus 10 is 20, 20, and then 10 times 0.6. So you line up with a 26 arrow in effectiveness. Then of course, if your inner tube is really, really heavy duty, then you, you're increasing it, but you also decrease the capability of the entire arrow as, as a cohesion flat. So there's always a balance. That's the reason, you know, we sell shaft for different purposes for the inner tubings. Now on these I inner mean, tubings, uh, right? Can mm -hmm. you like, um, why don't you just make the whole a whole, uh, uh, an, an inner tube to go the whole length of the inside of the shaft, would that be better or worse? Well, I mean, in, in case of, uh, we, we actually build arrow like that. That's Africa picking arrow, the dragon slayer. I mean, you, we are talking three inner tubes of the same identical length. I mean, the only thing you do is that you increase the spine. You also decrease the oxidation immensely. And in case of dragon slayer, we build arrow that's 12 spine, 12 to 15. Yes, you did hear me right. I mean, but then you're looking at arrow that's about 1,200 grain. That's for a whole different kind of ball game as far as like right. the close range shot, it's weight stability. No, dangerous game, 40, 50 yard shot. I mean, I got customers oh, okay. shooting Cape Buffalo at 60 yards with accuracy with a, with a 900 green arrow, that's 22 inch long. Yeah, but, but see the whole idea of the arrow concept is the there's a harmonic cancellation and oxidation reduction process. So when the arrow flexes, the, the inner tube will now, that's the reason, you know, originally we use some normal arrow and put in it. But we found out that that is not ideal. I mean, just like original, I just simply find a gold tip arrow with the OD of 298,000 and then using my glue to glue it. I found out that I'm not really optimizing it because see, I do not need the inner tube to have loop strength. 
See, the loop string is defined as a tube. When you bend it, it crushes on the OD. That's what loop string is. That means if your arrow, you, you put a knot in it, you crush it, you turn it, the arrow will split. That's loop strings. That's outer loop and inner loop string. But in the case of arrow concept tubes that we design, if you hold a tube and you push it down, you will go into longitudinal fibers. Because what we need the inner tube to do is to give you a whole lot of spine without needing any loop string, because we don't need it. The outer arrow have all the loop string you need. What we want to do is increase the spine of the shaft have a different oscillation cycle. And that's exactly why the inner tube is a single layer, is a single layer, is a single sheet linear layer carbon. In other words, if you burn it, you'll find out that it's nothing more than just carbon that's going one direction and you roll it. it it's kind of hard not to uh, talk about the veins in relation to the concept system because that's a big part of what makes it tick where we get all the Absolutely. benefits. Absolutely. We can sort of hint that a little bit. See, the moment if the arrow is flexing, okay, in the initial launch, and then you go into the first about the first oxidation cycle before you go to type of spin for the first 16 to 22 yards, depends on what shaft diameter you're talking about. That whole process, imagine if you increase the front of center, the front end stability will be higher, right? But then what happened to the tail? The more you put in the front end, the worse the tail is gonna get, isn't it? If the worse the tail, what happened to the veins on the tail? Now imagine you simply like, you cut off two fins of the fish and throw it back in the water. That's pretty much the reaction of your The tail is all over the place and it's not doing anywhere except you, you do not want it. That whole process used a humongous, it wasted a humongous of energy. It created a horrendous amount of, and you also, your arrow speed drops significantly. But then when people say, no, it's the same speed. Yes, you're still within that 18, 20, 22, or 23. Yeah, from the very front. So that whole process, the arrow is still in the, just like a gun is still inside the barrel. You have not seen anything yet until you pass, the, pass that point and go into a type elliptical spin. That's where the energy measuring difference is. So, so in your veins, that's achievable because just, I guess just so our listeners understanding, you have a higher spin rate vein without going into a lot of it. So your veins will spin faster and we can get into that tight uh, elliptical gyro, as you're saying, with it, with a shaft that with the concept system now is more stable so we can get all the benefits out of it. Well, if, if you look at history, I, in, I, um, the time that I come with arrow vein is about the time I come with arrow. It just simply worked in which I do not know why. It took me a few years to really get all the research now because I was very privileged to get some university professor like Professor Lele of Stanford, Professor Sele of Central Illinois, which I actually retained as my advisor. I mean, I was hoping that when we go to Aerovain, we actually get him online and talk a lot. Because he, I think a lot of people under, need to understand when we go into aerodynamics, that's not many people already know what they're talking about. And for me to find one of the world premier experts, Professor Sailing, which have designed over 120,000 airs lifetime, is a privilege to even listen to him if you want to know about aerodynamics. That's the reason I want to sort of delay the whole process. But at the same time, let's think about, not about veins general in the case of aero concept. Imagine you got blaze. I mean, first of all, people need to understand if you shoot over 280 feet per second, feathers have no three effect because feathers are collapsed. So you need to wait for the arrow to go below about 260 feet per second before they come back and do work. In the case of blazers and so on, the arrow concept is critical because if you do not have that, every time the arrow move up and down, left and right, especially with heavy FOC, the vein is, is pushing the arrow in different directions which now people put more FOC to guide it. But at the same time, there's more press on the back. It's like you're increasing the size of your parachute while you're increasing horsepower. It's mm -hmm. all like, I mean, yes, you sort of need to do that, but the whole idea is let the car go, not let it stop. You only sort of have the parachute after you finish the first 100 meter, whatever that is. I mean, just like you do drag race, you deploy your parachute before you reach the point. That pretty much is what most people are doing with the veins and the shaft. And that's what arrow cramps have prevented those things from happening. In other words, without arrow concept system arrow in a high compression ratio at high speed, it is like a drag car. You deploy your parachute when you launch, not when you want to stop. Am I helping? I mean, because I know different concept into this. So what kind of benefits are we seeing as far as... Um, Penetration, you know, get... retaining? 
I mean, yeah, flatter trajectory, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I mean, the error concept trajectory is, I mean, that's the reason when people start using error concept, right on the get-go, we find out that most of the you know, garment scope and so on don't work passing 40 yards. Everything from 50, 60 onwards is guaranteed is going to be off. Because see what happened is that you now deal with the entire third factor when you're dealing with the error drop. In the, in the old days, we always deal with two factors, which is weight and speed. I mean, you look at every single scope out there, they spin it, you input the weight and speed and you're done, right? So you're telling me that uh, if you've got a, got a truck that's empty, that's squared, with a truck that, with a sports car that is the same weight, going down the highway with the same horsepower, they will behave the same at 65 miles per hour. The answer is hell no. But that's pretty much what they're telling you. When you've got the same weight, you've got the same energy, which is speed, the arrow will have the same flight path. It's absolutely no. In case of the vein, it's not that critical for most guys, but the moment you go into a certain gyroscopic spin and certain oxidation process, that difference is quite significant. I mean, I will give you a hint a little bit to, before we go into, uh, go out of, uh, just like when we were doing testing back in nine, 2008, a normal bow shooting at 300 feet per second launch, just put, putting arrow wing two out of from a feather is a four to five inch difference at 60 yards. It's changing veins. We're not talking aero concept, nothing. That alone should give you some idea. And now, of course, that whole reason is the reason aero concept come in because we find out there's a lot of things and we try to take away all the best stuff. I did a brief little test not long ago that I was talking to you about before. I took a, um, uh, a, a zombie slayer arrow. I took a 2.0 system. I took a 1.0 system uh, with the 1.0 system being of the... Uh, same weight as the zombie slayer arrow and the 2.0 so, um was well i thought i had about 25 30 greens heavier and the 2.0 shot about two inches lower at about 20 yards than the other two the other two shot about right about the same at about 20 yards um 50 yards we started to see a significant difference to where the 1.0 um if i remember right was about a foot higher than the uh, zombie slayer of the same weight and the 2.0 system that shot two inches, about two inches lower, end up being about six inches higher than the zombie slayer. So it really made up eight inches in that. And as we went down range, we went all the way out to 120 yards. Uh, I lost the 1.0 because that just flew right over the four foot target using <laughs> the same crosshair. The, the 2.0 system went exactly 24 inches higher than than the um, zombie slayer shaft. It was about 25, 30 grains less. Wow. Yes. So we had a significant difference in point of impact. And this was using the same bow, same set of crosshairs um, on the target all the way out. I mean, we did the testing at 150 and 120, uh, 120 yards. But the it was pretty amazing to see that the heavier or even equal weight arrows that were custom built shot significantly higher and I, I can remember building my first concept system it was actually based on a black eagle challenger and i i got done with the, the show with the i did the dorch thing at harrisburg <laughs> and i was i got all this stuff in i spent a whole bunch of money at the show and i put it all together i did this titanium kit i put this error rest thing on my bow and i built this concept system challenger and it was four grains heavier than the Challenger I built with uh, Blazers insert, the, you know, the standard pro stop. So I shot it at 20 yards. They both had about the same point of impact at 20. I had my 50 yard pin. I had my brand new Reinhardt 3D Blackbeard target. And I said, I'm going to crack this at 50, see what happens. Well, put my 50 yard pin on her, click the, click the thumb, and uh, my arrow sailed about eight to 10 inches over the 3D Black Bear target right into the woods. And I'm like, wow, that probably was, I don't know, 30, 35 bucks right there. That was expensive. And <laughs> I, I had to, I had to jolt or had to be me, right? Chalked up another arrow, same thing, same flight path right over the Black Bear. And I said, I'll be damned. So I, I started messing with it. My 20 yard pin really became my 30 yard pin. It was actually pushing 32 yards with, me not having a chance. I mean, me hitting relatively within my shooting ability within the size of an egg between 20, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, my 30 yard pin was more like pushing 40 
at my 50, I mean, I was sailing over the, over the uh, black bear by eight to 10 inches. I mean, it just, it, it picked up a significant um, amount of uh, uh, arrow. Like, yes. Yeah. I, this- yeah. It was just, I, I, and I was floored and I was, you know, ever since then, uh, you know, testing these concept systems and stuff was really remarkable just to see that initial gain. And I, I did a lot of, did a lot of this with vertical bow shooting. And I had some of my, while shooting, my tightest groups were on concept system built arrows, actually on arrows that were by far not the straightest. It was George's first round of uh, arrow weave that were like <laughs> eight to 13 thousandths. And I was shooting, you know, under two and a half inch groups at over 90 yards with these things in wind. And it, it was pretty remarkable. The average shooter can gain when you work with this, with an entire system, when you work with the concept system, the rest of the titanium kit, when you really have a match system to get off of this, you get all the benefits. Well, actually, I really want to point out is that the idea of the concept system is that you make a normal, that we give a normal person a benefit of exceptional capability. That is borderline defining physics, but it is not. It's actually optimizing physics. Well, actually, Dave, you, and you mentioned concept 2.0. I want to talk so people know what they stand for. Arrow concept 1.0 is stand for having carbon tubing in the front of the arrow. Arrow concept 2.0 is pretty much what you're talking about is, is arrow concept on the back of the arrow. So the arrow concept 2.0 is having arrow in the, the carbon tubing in the front and in the back to the point that it will, no, it will now control the entire auction cycle. Well, in, in, a, in a pure sense, if you shoot say a 22, 22 size arrow, what we have discovered is that uh, in a normal arrow on the ordinary flex on a, tw- on a go-tip 22 with our arrow concept, as you will recover from 16 yards using a basic, your 30 inch, the 30 inch draw, 70 pound bow, IBO speed, okay? The moment you could arrow concept 1.0 about seven and a half inch in the front of the Coty 22, because that's what I did most of my test with. The arrow recover itself into a gyro difficult spin in about nine feet compared to 16 yards. You put arrow concept 2.0, the arrow shaft itself, putting another six inch on the back of a Coty 22, it'll recover into a tight elliptical spin in five feet. From different soft size, different arrow in the tube, different glue, different point weight, you're gonna have some difference. But at least based on what my, what the tests that we use are based on a baseline. And it is replicable because I built a lot of Black Eagle Challenger using this. We're using arrow concept 1.0 on a Challenger. It actually recovered also within nine, eight to nine feet because Challenger is a bigger arrow. The carbon is a little bit slower, or faster than a go tip 22. And if you put about six inch of carbon on the back of a Challenger, it is again recovered in less than five feet. Now, all this is great. The only thing is that if you are in the IBO shooting and ASA shoot, you don't see as much benefit because all this happened, as Dave said, it's around 40 to 50 yards and everything just like awesome. Now, based on what we have discovered is that with the arrow concept, the oxidation cycle reduction process really show its end at about 40 feet yard and out. Because then, just remember, your normal arrow, your initial 20 something yard, is pretty much your barrel guide process. And then your next 20 yard, you stop from like, like a bullet, just off your bullet, your, your barrel, it's pretty stable. But the moment you pass that 40 yards, that's where arrow concept shines. I mean, remember one time when Rod White was telling me, which I think he shared with you, Dave, because he, I didn't go, well, I was not too deep when he was doing his broomstick. As 50 yards, I re- sort of remember, he told me the difference between arrow concept and non arrow concept just on 1.0 is 28 feet per second on a 300, about 290 feet per second bolt. Yeah, he has a That's- video on that. He, he had a video with a write up on that where he built a concept system arrow. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was AV2 veins. I forget, I forget, but he, he had to write up and I don't know the exact words, but it was on Infinity Archery. He has it, he has a video up on on there still, I believe. Um, he did a test where he he did all the arrows of matched weight, and they all had the same lock time. I think he had your video cameras at the time because it was at high speed. And um, all the arrows leaving the bow at exactly the same speed, same lock time on there. He had uh, the arrow downrange is 28 or 29 feet per second faster than any other match weight arrow at 50 yards. And that's, that's substantial because 
you know, the archery industry sells bows based on feet per second. A guy will buy a bow because it's 340 and not 330 and not realizing that we can boost the downrange number just by an arrow build significantly. I mean, can you imagine telling the guy that we can get his bow and add 20 or 30 feet per second to it downrange where you need it? Because no one's shooting, no one's really shooting a deer at right in their launch cycle. Nobody's shooting a deer at, you know, two or three feet away. I'm not saying nobody has, but generally speaking, you're shooting a deer at 30, 40, 50 yards. That's where you want to, well, maybe not you. Maybe no, not no, no, no. Feet. Most people, <laughs> when they talk, like the industry said, most deer are killed within 25 yards. That's the reason a lot of people do not understand the benefit, and they also don't care the benefit. I think we need to rethink because the, the same thing uh, when we, we go into, especially with the arrow concept. Arrow concept is meant for arrow shoot long distance and ultra long distance. But we need to define what long distance means. The a basic arrow industry, the archery industry, anything over 25 yards. In a lot of people, I personally, we're talking national archery coach level personnel, literally told me that I am an ethical because I promote shooting over 25 yards. Wow. So when, when, when we explain to people how arrow concept behaves and how you can actually shoot 100, 120, 150 yards. As a matter of fact, I want to sort of share with you a little bit, explain what we just did. On the 10.505, yes, we're talking 505 feet per second. We find out technically no arrow will work. But the moment I throw a set of arrow concept system on it, it all worked. So what does that mean? I, I think I think there's some <laughs> point in what that guy was telling you. Because, you know, think back to when you first started archery, whether it's probably a long time ago. I know for me it was shoot, probably 30 years now, right? You always got told that you want to take a deer at 20, 25 yards. So now if you look up and follow through the development of archery bows, we had these, we went from uh, two, three hundred dollar uh, Oneida bows to now we got, Fifteen, sixteen hundred dollar carbon airs and everything else. We have all this big advancement in bows, but the the mentality out there is still 20, 25 yards. And I'm not saying nothing's wrong, anything's wrong with that. But considering the dollar amount and the way that the archery industry has as a whole came up in in um in in, in technology, the ability to kill something didn't get any further. We're still on 20, 25 yards. That's I, I think that's in part of the arrow and the component end of it never caught up with the with the industry to we have these advancements that we do with fire knock products to lengthen that to maybe 35, 40 yours where somebody now has can get confidence. Well, to actually, shoot, I, take deer at a longer range versus they're stuck in well, I'm only capable of 20, 25 yards. And I and 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 I'm not saying for everybody to go out there and do that i'm you know i don't pose any limits on anybody but you know based on the common equipment of what you're going to see in bass pro shops or walmart or cabela's yeah i would say yeah only shoot a deer at 25 yards if you want to shoot a deer further uh have have an easier with tuning i'd say try to fire next step yeah i think well, that's, that's what's going to do it i think um i think you're seeing with effective ranges in the western hunting those effective ranges are longer than that 20, 25 yard range. A lot of people are, are, they accept the fact that you can shoot an animal at 60 yards. When you start talking to people about whitetails, they're like, no, 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 no. Whitetails 25 yards and in. And I think you're, it's starting to shift a little bit. Um, you'll mm -hmm. hear people talk about their effective range being 40 yards. There's a lot of people now that are in the whitetail area. They're like, oh, I'll shoot a deer at 40 yards, 40 yards and under. So like that 40 yard mark is now the new, the old 25 is now kind of getting to 40. And uh, I think that's probably some, that's probably because of the uh, added technology that we have. I shot a deer this mm -hmm. year at 42 yards in North Dakota. And then I also shot a deer this year in Ohio at four yards. So like I need, I need to have something that's effective at both. Um, but I think the, I think the social acceptance on that 25 yard mark is starting to, get a little that effective yep. range is starting to lengthen up well i, I well, think what happens is a lot of the guys that are shooting at that yardage you know from, from what i see on forms and stuff is some of them guys out west are using like the 166 shafts and what i don't think it's technology as much as the weight 
of the arrow and what FOC that they're adding to it, that they're adding all this weight to make it happen because they really, it's, it, they're really not known how to stabilize a shaft. Like I have no problem with building a carbon tech cheetah, which is one of the lightest shafts out there in the standard shaft world with a concept system um, to go on an elk hunt and have somebody shoot that at uh, an elk at 50 or 60 yards, because I know I can stabilize a light shaft to where, these guys have to add a ton of point weight, ton of insert weight to try and make up for FOs, you know, to get to get the weight up there just to make it happen. So I don't think it's as much as technology as we're approaching it more like a caveman. And we just got to take this big club out to make it happen. That's fair. Well, actually, you know, that maybe I'll bring back when I first talked about this with Screaming actually, oh, Alaska and also Full Carl Dave, another Dave out in Alaska. They both told me one thing. He said that you don't understand. We don't shoot an animal under 70 yards. Most of the animal in, in my last tech was an animal at 120 yards. I say, what? He said, on the tundra, where do you hide? Yeah, you can't get close to them. I mean, you pretty much have to go from one ridge, wait for them to go over the ridge, and then you shoot it when they are passing over the ridge. How close are you? I say, why do you just take a hole and stay and say, that's thermofrost. I just saw like... A, Damn. Oh, dude. I say, you should go behind a rock. I say, what rock? If you got a rock there about three inches tall, pretty much laugh at me. And then, of course, the uh, the gentleman from Screaming Eagle Archery was one of the first guys who used my arrow mains. And also, but he never, he never go into arrow concept because unfortunately, like a lot of, a lot of dealers that we, we work with, deal with, the moment you need to tell them they need to be carefully built, putting the glue and then shot the arrow wait, wait 36 hours and so on. That pretty much drive everybody out because nobody want to take the time. Sure. I mean, the, the, I say, well, you can put the arrow aside and then you, you cut the back and then you always say, no, no, no. We, we, we usually want to do the whole thing in one shot. Insert. <laughs> and then, you know, that don't really work in today's archery. It's like people say, well, you know, I just got some powder and then shove this bullet down on the casing. I'm good. First shop a little bit too. <laughs> everybody in Walmart can do that. I have, um, I have two questions with, uh, mm-hmm. so... One of the main benefits that I'm hearing from the arrow concept is impact point at 40 yards and out. Now, mm-hmm. say say I have a typical setup with my arrow, and I do have that shot at 25 yards at a deer. Compared mm-hmm. to a normal shaft, wouldn't wouldn't penetrate? What are the best? Yeah, yeah. What- there's about eight to 12 percent energy difference. Yeah, those are big numbers. Actually, as a matter of fact, I'll give you one last number, for, which I get from Rod White. Is that with the arrow concept, that is a diff- that can be a difference, maximum difference using everything we have at 60 yards. That can be a 38% difference in energy lost. Now, I will give you one last example from one of my very good, very good dealers, Jeremy Martin, which I think will bring him up one of these days to talk about his bill for one of my uh, very dear customer. He's in his late 60s, early 70s. He have a 26-inch draw a maximum of 50 pound pool. We build, he built an arrow concept 2.0 arrow. He blow that elk at 68 yards. Man. And people want to talk about heavy poundage penetration. His arrow is not even 300 grains. Man. So as more you learn, I mean, I mean, if you're an average guy, young, healthy, 30, 29 inch draw, 70 pound, shooting a 400 plus grain arrow, you pretty much don't care about any of those. But if you are like me or my customer that older, imagine, and shorter, like some of us, when, when you are what you call drawling challenged, this <laughs> become critical. Yeah, seriously, think about it. you got a 26-inch draw with a maximum 50-pound pool. Actually, you end up with 47 pounds when you go. So the impact, impact height, mm-hmm. it's possible. And I'm hoping to see a swing blade coming from uh, Fire Knock with a little titanium stuff on it in the future. So this will really make it happen. I built an arrow light enough but stable enough to where my 20 yard pin at 45 yards only had about four to six inches of drop which technically means i can be one pin with zero to 45 yards no problem with in the tolerance of the of the size of a deer's heart yeah that's huge which which is very significant i just need to need a little bit of the altercation of the swing blade door knows what i'm talking about he's going to make a hat i think that's huge for a whitetail guy um a lot of people guy are... you could take you take guesswork out of it because i get a lot of guys that are like you know when they first come to me oh man i gotta 
put my 30 yard pin on and I should have had my 25 yard or my 20 yard on it. And it's like, well, what if I can, you know, squash that? And I, for the general, for the general purpose, you know, that 20, I can get the guy to go from 20 to 30 into one, one pin. I mean, plus or minus like a half yard where it's not even uh, uh, really relevant in a hunting situation. But when we start really tweaking the builds, playing with them, we can, and start trying to push it. Um, 35 yards on one pin is, is acceptable depending on draw length and poundage. My arrow was like about a 335, 40 grain arrow at the time. Um, and it was on based on a 67 pound bow and about a 20, 29 and a half inch draw, which is right in there for a lot of guys. Um, you know, to have, a, have one pin out for a guy that's 30, 35 yards is huge. Even when we start talking 3D and hunter's class, you know, because a lot of guys will like to do, uh, they'll go hunting and they'll take their bow out and they want to do 3D. Well, you know, hunter class is what, 35 yards? Well, with the discrepancy of maybe an inch or two, why not let the guy have some fun so he's on target, you know, in that, in, in the rings on on one pin and shoot, you know, shoot that. Both site. With- the beauty is that, I mean, I, 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 uh, I think Nick, when we go into the 166, I will bring the guy from Aaron from uh, Horse Archery. Who, who actually I convinced and he tried. Because he, a lot of people don't understand 166 is really the only way, no, the, the, the arrow concept is the only way for you to shoot the 166 and the 204. Now remember, we talk about how 166 take about 20, 23 yards to recover. What happened if we put an arrow concept in 166? What's the recovery now? Remember, the difference between 166 over, two, uh, over two, uh, 246 and a 300 is 16 to 23 yards recovery. And the moment we put arrow concept in uh, 246 and 300, we dropped 600%. Now we now put, what happened if we put one arrow concept in 166? 166 is such a bad arrow because of its memory effect and think, because think about memory effect. With the arrow concept, we're able to drop it down to around 20 feet for it to recover. That's huge. 20 feet over 23 yards. Come on, think about the numbers. In the case of 204, 204 would make two tubes. The 204 is really heavy. The 204 heavy on a basic 300 spine, six, six, six inch tube on a 204. And the heavy weight, it will recover in six feet. But then you're also adding, adding 50 grains on carbon tube. But a 204 light, which a lot of people, including the gentleman from uh, uh, Ozonics, he, he loved the concept, but he don't like the weight. So I had to build him some 204 light. It did exactly what I said it would. And his recovery of the arrow is around 15 feet. Yes, sir. When we, when we put the concept system in it and we get the stability, we're minimizing the, the flex down range, the arrow is flying truer. Mm-hmm. What does that do for the benefit of the angle of, a, of the point on? Yep, actually, the, I, I totally forgot about that split part. What the whole deal is that, I think the very very simple I want to bring back into your days of if anybody of us had cooked cut a tomato, imagine this: your knife is on top of it and you cut it down. Now shift your knife slightly by about three degree and try to cut. Now imagine your arrow did not recover. The point is now flinging up and down like crazy because of the node, and you happen to hit the animal close. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an incident. One of my customers called me back and say, "Hey, I shoot my." high power crossbow at, a, at an elk, which is seven feet from me. He, by the way, he's an army, retired army ranger. He got full ghillie shoot. That arrow hit the animal and broke into seven pieces. He showed me the picture. That's where the problem is. If the arrow do not recover from the oxidation cycle and you, you erupt the entire process, the arrow can, can explode in really short range if the power is high enough. It doesn't happen in vertical boats, just so you feel calm about it. But the fact is that if you do not get the arrow to recover, I don't care what broadhead you use. You just cut 30, 40, 50, 70% of the broadhead penetration ability. It's the same thing. I try to hold a knife, point it down straight into the meat. Now give it three degree, point it down the street, five degree, point it down the meat, and 15 degree, point it down the meat. You know exactly what I mean. And that's exactly what the benefit of arrow concept because the tubing is in the front, which means the front is always, always pointing straight. Now I had a, a number of times um, 
actually happened to uh, somebody I know too. Um, as far as customer I had coming in, he was had a vertical bow. He was hunting mm-hmm. on the mountain, and you know, although he was in a tree stand, where the deer came out was almost like looking at him because of the incline. But it was only at like seven, eight yards. And the guy's a good shooter, um, well tuned bow, high poundage bow. Was shooting a rampage arrow, I believe. And um, the arrow, he hit it good, made a good play shot on it. But it only went in like two, three inches. Got poor penetration, and he just watched the deer in his binoculars go over the ridge and never seen it again. And he was asking me what you know what happened. I said, well, you know, you're, sh- you're just shooting the typical uh, half out arrow veins Mm -hmm. at close range i said odds are the arrow wasn't fully recovered and you hit it more so with the side side of the broadhead versus direct in no that actually that is where the design of the broadhead becoming critical if you got a trial cut tip or a cut or impact tip and also depends on how the angle of the tip hits or is it the case when you use a front end deploy and deploy mechanical i think that's pretty much oh well, then, uh, then definitely not the case. But I know a lot of customers actually show me pictures of they shooting an animal a little bit further with one of those front-end deploy and rear deploy arrow at the angle. I mean, the fact is that we proved to it from all the experiment I did, I proved to, my, I proved to myself that if you shoot a rear deploy, my front-end deployed broadhead, and you hit it at anything over 35 degrees, and if one of the front-end deploy and the front caught the the arrow will swing sideways because the arrow are still flexing. That flex process caused the two blade to open like a scissor and the arrow now goes sideways instead of forward. I noticed that on also, impact mm-hmm. with uh, the high speed cameras, you know, the, the front of the arrow when it was impacting the water bottle was very rigid. I mean, held true, just like we said it would. And the, the back of the arrow without the concept had a significant whip to it. And yes, you're going to get it. You're going to get on one of my videos. You're not going to see it real clear. So I didn't really put it out there because it was fuzzy. Um, but when I did it with a 2.0 system and I mm-hmm. shot an eggplant, but I did it at like 11,000 frames a second, the 2.0 system only had a slight little flex in the arrow was no, like, if you looked at the 1.0 system, the back of the arrow had the severe kick to it on the mm-hmm. back of the arrow where it went the buck one. I said, okay, well, there's no stability back there yet. Everything's based on shaft and vein only structure. But with mm-hmm. the 2.0 system, even with the longer arrow, because I did it on a 26 inch arrow, when I hit something like an eggplant, it just had a natural slight little flex mm-hmm. in the middle of the shaft, but no severe kick. And I said, wow, I said, that's going to be a much more, that's going to be much more stable um, retaining energy after after impact on impact and after impact through the animal absolutely that's beauty of 2.0 i mean you think about a 2.0 it's like you got a train you got a train compare a truck the 1.0 you said you got a long truck the 2.0 is got a train coming through that's the beauty see people don't understand the, the difference between the the energy disbursement and also an arrow the arrow is that the end people don't think you need to think of the entire air as a continuous unit. When it goes in, the ray of the arrow is coming forward. But then a lot of people keep on trying to think, oh, heavy front of center, have neglecting, and actually they're degrading the back of the arrow. When you really shoot an animal, the back of the arrow is part of the equation. Otherwise, you won't have been, I mean, the back of the arrow is not just to hold the knot so the front of the arrow can go somewhere else. You need to think of the entire arrow as the as a flight pro, projectile. You need to make every single part of it work for you. The moment you front of center the front heavily, you are just killing the back. But just to say, imagine this, which is which is a lot of high speed camera, not just mine or your that, that you made. You notice that if you front of center heavy the arrow, the moment you hit the target, the entire tail arrow at the same time when you look at it closely, when it flexes, the arrow actually is going backwards. Just like if you put a pole in the ground and you flex the pole, the pole actually come up instead of go down. Everyone in the- uh, it's actually the re- factors of energy. Just like when a fish tail move back, back and forward, it go forward. But if you directionally, it go backwards. So I would, I would also go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, I have a question on the arrow concept. When okay, say I'm a consumer and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hearing you guys talk about this, and what 
like what physical components am I receiving if I'm switching to an aero consultant? First of all, I would not recommend you do that. I was, I would, that's the reason I got a front of my interest. That's the one of the worst thing you can do is that try to build your aero consult system on your own. I mean, for you, mm -hmm. like say I go to a, oh, I yeah. go to you, what are the physical yep, yep. components that, what makes yes, up okay. an aero uh, The aero concept is nothing more than a tube, a carbon tube that we specially designed is a linear carbon tube and an insert for the aero concept 1.0. So the aero tube is able to anchor itself on the insert and then glue into the front of the aero shaft. The aero concept 2.0 is a whole different ballgame because now you need skill and ability and the knowledge of gluing. You need to now glue the aero tube to the back of the aero, in front of the neck, or pre more preferably in front of, just in slightly overlap the vein. Because at that moment, the only thing that holds that tube there is the glue and nothing else. So the cleaning process, the chamfering of the tube, the control of the glue, the temperature of gluing, all of them become so important. I mean, let me give you give an idea. One of my customers tell me that one of my dealer who glue aero concept and tell me it doesn't work. I have to ask him, where do you glue it? In my basement? What's the temperature? Well, it's so cold. The fact is that the AG, AGUSSE requires 70 plus temper, degree temperature to function. Otherwise, the crystallization is too fast, and eventually the powder will form crystallization will form powder, and the whole thing will fail. The second part, you said you also need moisture, and then you, you can't go to something like that. That, that actually offer my dealers in Canada, which have super cold. Now they learn; they keep the freaking office at seventy-five degree, and then they have the humidifier. It makes all the difference in the world. And at the same time, you know, like one customer told me, he was gluing everything and nothing right. The glue just failed. I said, no. Why is it? Explain to me. He explained everything to me. And I, Where do you mix your glue? He makes it on a piece of cardboard. I said, that's why. You, you promoted two things. First of all, when you mix it in the cardboard, most of the hardener will sip into the cardboard. Your ratio is no longer one to one. The second, cardboard will accumulate heat. You are forcing the glue to cure faster. You should use it on a piece of aluminum in foil when you mix epoxy. All those small things are so critical because most people, you know, in normal time, they just make it fast, but the guy took his time to, he makes it all the, because he, he thought he got close to two hours to work with it. So he mixed the part and let it sit for half an hour before he glue it. But guess what? He just lost 15% of his head to the cardboard. <laughs> we talk about the uh, penetration and stuff of the arrow and the, that's all good, but I don't want to miss out on the point that the 2.0 system when shooting at, especially when you get out to like the 50, 60 yards net, is on a, I've noticed it on a vertical bow. It's a much more forgivable system to shoot. It's 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 just easier when you have when you have that much more added stability in the shaft, mm -hmm. your shot because right. I had a I had a way easier time shooting at 50, 60 yards than I even did with the 1.0 concept system where I had to have more form to execute the shot versus I was allowed to be a little bit off and still make it there with a 2.0 system. And I I flipped around from 1.0 to 2.0 the whole day, off and on the whole day doing that saying, and I just can't, it was a much more forgivable system. 2.0, Aero Concept 2.0 is pretty much the, I mean, I have to, because when, when you and Tony both tell me 2.0 is the way to go, I really don't want to go into that troublesome of putting that tube on the back. But you know what? It proved that it was such a good system, except, I'm generally lazy, okay? <laughs> that 2.0 system is just like, I know how good it is. I build some 2.0 crossbow arrows. It's like, damn, are they good? Because he, the 2.0 arrow, my 65-yard pin become my 80-yard pin in my crossbow. Yeah. I just added 15 yard. Man. I mean, it was very accurate. That was my problem. I say, oh my God, I really love this stuff. But that's the reason I really try to find an easy way to, for people to put 2.0 without going to extreme. But that is, you really need to learn this process. I think in some way, that's reason I, I actually, that was the beginning of the aero, the fine art certifying train stuff, because I really think I need my dealer to learn this stuff. Because if they don't, you trying to build a 2.0 and build it wrong, you're going to hate it. You would just waste like, a lot of money and not getting the result. Yeah, sure. 1.0 and 2.0 does. The aero concept, will, when you put into aero shaft, it will give you three major factors. The first of all, you get a flatter trajectory. You got a faster recovery. You can shoot an animal at shorter distance without causing it to explode in the case of crossbow. All this means that you got way much better penetration, way higher impact point, and not to mention that's one thing for a lot of traditional guys. A lot of guys really love is that the arrow becomes super quiet. Now, how come you're super quiet? Because the things are no longer in chaos; they are even now. I uh, I, I think we uh, should mention that 
for the guy that's the you know works five six days a week he um he needs an arrow that he doesn't have to spend hours and hours with tuning and when we when we spine locate the arrow we build the arrow with the concept system this makes him going out there and shooting because a lot a lot of people only practice them one or two weeks before season because of family work etc this is a is a significant benefit because it helps dampens some of the some of the errors that occurred that the shooter doesn't even know he has now granted if the guy's if the guy is um so terrible that he drives the truck off the road you can't help him but for a lot of minor areas this significantly plays a factor in the shot and allowing him to have just fun shooting instead of him rack his brain out yeah actually the 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 with the arrow concept you're putting 1.0 you can pretty much give an average guy an extra three to five yard with his current setup. I mean, that pretty much is the bottom line. But for the for the guy who really want to shoot long distance, I mean, I hate to say that, but just like the, he showed me two customers of his is going nuts. I mean, we are talking to take the at 120 yards, which I don't think is I don't think is right. But hey, the guy killed it. The guy killed it effectively. Give him all the confidence in the world to do it. I mean, I'm not saying that me and you can shoot 2,100 yards and kill somebody with a super expensive rifle. But when you have the training and the confidence to do it, when you call, it's your personal call. But at least you know that equipment is capable. Now the question is that, not that if you want to, you can't. Now if you have the training with the equipment, you can't. That's the difference. Yeah, I love and, it. And, and there's a lot of other variables that are into this because, you know, when you're out hunting, you know, it's a lot of the times it's not that bright, sunny, 70, 80 degree day that you practice on. You're in a tree, you're in a tree that's moving. You may have 10 or 15 mile an hour wind. You may have, you may have to shoot through solid objects such as rain and snow. And all these factors play into throwing your accuracy off when you, when you need a lot of this to, uh, you know, take a little bit of that, take a little bit of that back. And, and keep the accuracy within your game. We, you know, we often talk about all the technology and a lot of guys will be like, oh, this is super complicated stuff. And, and getting, getting to this point, yes, it, 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 it took a lot of that to get there. But in actuality, the end result is we're making the shot simple. Sorry. There's a lot of technology and stuff that goes into this to make it easier for the shooter. And at the end result, it's the basic shaft that you're shooting that ends up being that ends up being complicated because you have all the errors to deal with as compared to a custom built shaft. Absolutely. I mean, I, I saw. Let me start end this with a with a with a with a with a history joke. I remember when I, when I first got my first car. Every time I go in the car, I put the key in. I say a small prayer. And now I drove my wife's Pacifica. Every time we stop at a headlight, red light, the freaking engine stopped. I mean, that's the difference between technology. I mean, the, the the fact is that the technology is significantly improving. I'm very glad that we are part of the, the movement. But at the same time, I really think that people need to really rethink what the entire air launch cycle is. The, the arrow is not just an arrow. I will always tell people, just like software, when a long time ago, you spent all the money in hardware, then you find out all the money in software. Now you find out all the money in service. The same thing with archery. In the old days, everybody spent all the money in their bowl. I think they really need to think about the arrow shaft and how to build it. I agree. I agree. So what are we going to cover next week? Let's give, let's give everyone a, a little sneak peek. Well, I think week. we are going to go into the knocks and inserts. Another one, arrow component with a touch of arrow thing. I think that will pretty much tied up everything we talked about for the last three times because we now we're going to put it together. Perfect. Perfect. I look forward to it. All right, guys, that's a wrap on today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please leave us a review in the comments. Go check out the podcast on Dorge's Fire Knock TV channel. Leave any comments you have there. Yep. Uh, I want to make sure that, you know, all the in individual podcasts, you can put individual comment per episode, and I will answer every single one of them. All right? So uh, let's go from there. I know people is not going to look into this until later. We use the YouTube channel to rehost the podcast so you can leave comment and I can answer. We intend to leave that for a very long time as time as we build the entire knowledge base. Thanks, George. You're very welcome. Thanks, Gary. And, and we'll talk to you again, Dave. I'll see you. Have a good one.